Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Happy Fender Friday everybody! This one's also part of Trade Tuesday, but we're just gonna do this review and demo style. I'll cover the rest of the story on Tuesday. So this is what is known as the beautiful Fender TC90. It is an abomination of a Fender guitar, and that is why I absolutely love it. It has a set neck, you've got an adjust-o-matic, a double cutaway. On top of that, it's a thin line, so you got an F-hole right here. You've got American Seymour Duncan P90s in this Korean-made guitar. Master volume, master tone with a three-way toggle switch and a cool finish. So let's talk about why each of these things are a little bit different than normal. So first off, the set neck construction. No, it's not neck through or anything. They just kind of set the neck and glue it in. Very similar to how Gibson did the original Flying Vs and like that SG Elegant. Now that doesn't mean there aren't other set neck Telecasters out there like I did a review of the Merle Haggard Tough Dog Tele, but it's just not a spec you see every day. The Adjust-O-Matic tailpiece, obviously it's kind of like a Gibson product. They call theirs Adjust-O-Matic, whereas Gibson calls theirs the Tune-O-Matic. It feels very at home for me. The double cutaway, I'm not as big of a Fender historian buff, but the only other one I know of is the Fender Double Cut Telecaster. And I really like that guitar too. The thin line, obviously it goes back to the thin line Telecasters. But what I really like about this being a thin line, I don't even notice the double cutaway. Like this doesn't feel like a Telecaster, it just feels like something new. It just feels like a great guitar to play. Having American pickups in a foreign guitar, this is kind of something I talked about on my last Epiphone episode. I really like these guitars because you still have the sounds that you're expecting out of the American pickups. Now I'm sure you don't have the wiring and all that in here. So that leaves some room for upgrades in the future. But I was just surprised at how good this guitar sound and played stock. The special pick guard and kind of the P90 sense here reminds me of a Cabernita. You can check out this review of a parts caster I did. Now traditionally those will have like a filter Tron pickup, but it's kind of, you know, within the same route. So you could also do like mini humbuckers in this thing. And then normally a Telecaster would have this style, but this one, it still lines up, but they moved the three-way toggle switch over here and gave it more of like that Les Paul Gibson style one. So this is just like that perfect blend of weird specs and hearkening back to other different models. But on top of that, look at this gorgeous finish. So when were these things made? Is it something you can still buy today? Eh, kind of, but not really. So these were made from mid 2004 until late 2007. They did approximately 700 in each color. And there were two colors, vintage white and black cherry burst. Now I really dig this black cherry burst, but I think that vintage white also looks really cool. But one of my favorite features here has to be the matching headstock. It really ties these guitars together. Now the back of the neck, it's completely black. Yeah, it's a little bit boring, but you still have the wood grain on the back, which I'm really enjoying on this ash body. But these were discontinued in 2007, but don't fear. A guy named Jim Atkins then picked this up as his signature model. He's the guy from Jimmy Eat World. And if that doesn't ring any bells for you, they did this song. But he took this very Gibson player friendly guitar and took it even closer to Gibson specs by uh, changing a few things. Now you can get different finishes on this one like Crimson and Natural, but the biggest thing that he changed was the Fender scale length. He chopped it down to the Gibson scale, 24 and three quarters inches. He gave it more of the Les Paul control layout, meaning you have two independent volumes and tones for each pickup. His was made in Indonesia and they called it the JA90. And there's a few other differences. I actually learned about these models from another YouTuber. His name is Daryl Braun. He did a review of one of those. And ever since I happened to catch that episode, I was like, yeah, I want to try one of those freaky things. So to learn a little bit more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take an up close look at its individual parts. All right, inside the TC90, now that I've got it all nice and polished up, let's take a look at these pickups. Now at first glance, I was like, oh great, there's no markings or anything. But if you lift up these foam blocks just a little bit, you can see what they are. And the neck is the SP90-1N. This uses an Alnico 5 magnet. And the bridge pickup is the SP90-3B. 
And here's what it looks like with the pickup cover not on them. So as far as the routes themselves, nothing too special going on here, but you do have the two mounting screws for the P90 pickups. As far as the readings, neck pickup about 7.88k ohms, bridge position twice as hot, 14.29, and the middle position, 5.14. Moving on to the bridge, it's very Gibson in style. They call it the Adjusto-Matic instead of Tuna-Matic, and it reads TSR on the bottom. Here's what the tailpiece looks like. Nothing too spectacular here. It definitely has some good weight to it, but what's kind of interesting about the hardware is it looks chrome, but it also looks very dark at the same time. It's like a mixture between black and chrome. It's kind of cool, because you get that same vibe on the knobs too. But just in case you didn't notice, I did take the pick guard off, so this is what it would look like if you wanted to do that. There's not an extra F-hole over here or anything. Looking inside the F-hole, you can tell this is an ash body, and it's paired with a maple neck with a rosewood fretboard. Now, what's kind of cool about this rosewood board is it has abalone dot inlays. That's not something you see too often, and I'm not a huge abalone fan, but for whatever reason, I think it looks really cool on these dots. You don't have too much fretware to go over here, but you do have some like fingernail divoting right there. These frets are rather tall. Doing big bends on these is definitely going to be pretty easy. The face of the headstock just has the Fender logo on there, and I love the matching colored headstock. I think it really works on these models and makes them a little bit more special than the rest. And you do have two string trees on this model. I get a nut width of 1.64 inches, which increases to 2.02 at the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.75. That stays really consistent, 0.78 at the 12th. It's definitely a very thin profile, but kind of has a roundedness to it. And the TC90s are going after the traditional fender scale, 25 and a half inches. Moving on to the back side, you can see that beautiful wood grain back here. I think that's my favorite thing about ash body fenders is the wood grain. But inside the control cavity, not too much going on here. Just your standard kind of overseas style pots and a three-way toggle switch. And if you get through all that stuff, there is a little barcode that you could scan and fender could tell you about this guitar. But let's take a look at this neck heel joint. I'm sure this would scare some people if they looked at this and then they saw this line. This kind of happens on Gibsons all the time. You'll start to see a line where the neck joins to the body. Now on the Jim Atkins version, when it's natural, you can see that's just like the extended part of the body that kind of just meets onto the neck. So that's nothing to worry about. But, but if you choose the black cherry version, just know that you are going to have that little line there. It's a little bit of a visual eyesore, but it's kind of cool how they joined the neck to the body like that. And I really like the way that they sculpt it away. So even though it's kind of a, a clunky heel, it's refined enough that it's super comfortable. But the rest of the neck, it's just that black finish. It's all gloss, no satin necks or anything. I think that'd be a nice touch as well. And you can see our serial number here, 041470, made in Korea. This example weighs 6 pounds, 3.4 ounces. Let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. Now 
know how this instrument sounds. What are my final thoughts on this guitar? You know, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Was I gonna love it? Was I gonna hate it? Was I not gonna like it at all? All I knew is that they were relatively inexpensive on the used market. We're talking anywhere between like in really bad condition, 350 to really good, like maybe 700. I think that's even stretching it because you can get one of those brand new Jim Atkins models for 825. But I'm gonna have a hard time listing this one. It feels like such a professional guitar. The P90s that are in it sound amazing. It's just such a great value for the money that I could definitely see somebody professionally gigging this guitar. Yeah, you might wanna change out the tuners for something you like better, get a professional setup, redo the wiring, but I think stock, I mean, it's perfectly fine as is. There was nothing that I thought, ooh, that needs instantly changed. The one thing I will say is the 60 cycle hum is very strong with this guitar with the P90s. That was like the first thing I noticed when I hit the distortion is like, wow, that's louder than normal. But the bridge pickup has excellent clarity. And that's something I kind of test with that death clock riff. This note sometimes will get lost if your pickups aren't very clear. And I noticed that with the middle position and the neck pickup, it's kind of hard to hear that. But that doesn't mean that the neck pickup sounded bad either. It just excelled in more solo type territories. One downside though, is the neck and middle position almost sounds the same. The only thing I kind of want to knock this guitar for is the neck profile. It's not my favorite. You might like it if you're kind of a shreddery guy, cause it's, it's rounded, but it feels very flat. As we saw with the neck dimensions, it is a very small neck. I would personally prefer a little bit more beef to it. And my last comment is it's a little bit neck heavy. It wants to rest parallel to the floor. I would definitely highly suggest checking one of these out if you ever see one. They're a little bit freaky, but I dig them. That's the end of this review. I'll go ahead and go over the condition if you're interested in trading for or purchasing this guitar. Face of the headstock here, you can see you've got some string chain scratches. The most noticeable one is like right here in this area and then tons of small ones right there. The fretboard was just conditioned. Your frets were polished. You're good to go. I did not really even see any fretware on this one. Again, beautiful abalone inlays here. Now the face of the guitar, it's got lots of scratches. There's a few nicks and dings here and there. There's kind of a large ding right here. You also have some along the edges here. I'm hoping these are showing up good enough for you to see. Yeah, it's definitely not mint condition. It is a player's grade guitar. You got lots of scratches and picking wear on the pick guard because you're gonna find this. This would be like a good punk guitar, I think. The Seymour Duncan wording is kind of being rubbed off the pickup covers. So if you hate that that's there, you can erase it. Backside of the headstock, you do have some edge wear along the ball end of the headstock right there. A little bit worn through the finish. Nothing too crazy. Back of the neck, kind of the same thing going on. With this being a black finish, it shows fingerprints. It's kind of annoying when you're trying to present a guitar like this, but you just have minor impressions on the neck here. As we were kind of talking about on the bench, you can see where the neck was set into the body. That's just a small line. It's not separating or anything, but it is there. And the back of the instrument, I mean, is it chewed up by buckle worming necessarily? No, but you do have quite a few scratches. I'll try to catch some of those in the light here. There are some deeper gouges in some areas. But I mean, if you're just looking for one of these to gig, I think you're definitely going to be pretty happy with this condition. You don't have to be scared to get it scratched and scuffed up even more. Now, I believe these are Schaller's on here. Either that or it's something Fender put on it, but well, I my Schaller strap locks fit on it. So they're probably just been replaced. So you're good to go there. Let's go ahead and check it out under black light. We've got a glower here. It doesn't glow a lot, but it's got at least a little bit here. Because the only thing I feel this guitar is missing is binding along the neck. That's that one last Gibson thing that I think they could have done. But everything is looking good here. Move on to the back of the headstock and along the sides. 
And on to the back. I would say this definitely passes the black light test here. With no surprises, thankfully. Unfortunately, this one came to me without a case, so hey, the Kahaya gig bag came in handy. I'll go ahead and throw this one in. You know, it's got some good padding to it. It'll help protect it from scratches and shipping. And you know, maybe I was a little bit harder on this gig bag during my unboxing first impressions. There's a decent amount of padding here, but it's not gonna like protect it from me chucking this off the roof. So if you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Fender TC90, Feel free to send your trade offers to tradetrogly at gmail.com. Check out the link in the description for the reverb for sale page for availability. Thank you, Troglodytes, for tuning in today, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.